uh, we're going to uh, move to the Department of Revenue. And um, we have Commissioner Bowerly. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on your reappointment as Commissioner of Revenue. And also with her is Miss um, Starr and Miss Raleigh. And so uh, I know we asked you to talk primarily about tax filing for this year, uh, but also anything general that you might have, um, anything on the Wayfair decision, those type of things, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to do that. Uh, members, what I would ask is that we'll wait and do questions at the very end after all the presentations. And so right, if you got a question, write it down and remember it and we'll do that at the end. So uh, Commissioner, again, thank you for being here and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Good morning, my name is Cynthia Bowerly and I am the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Revenue. And with me this morning are Assistant Commissioner Rowley and Assistant Commissioner Starr. And what we're hoping to do this morning is to give you an update on the filing season, which starts on Monday, January 28th. Um, I know you'll all be spending your weekend getting your tax forms ready and, and getting ready to file. Um, and if not, you have until April 15th. So there, that deadline is still uh, out there. Uh, we wanted to share with you what we've been doing since the last legislative session. And because we, you have some new members to this committee, we thought we'd uh, give you a little bit of a department overview and update of where we've been, including some important issues like uh, the Wayfair decision that affected Minnesota. Uh, in your packets, members, you have both uh, the PowerPoint presentation and then a number of handouts that we'll be referring to. Um, the first is, is sort of an overview of, of what the department does and who our customers are and what we do on behalf of the state of Minnesota. So um, you, I hope uh, those of you who've been on the committee are familiar with, first I have to figure out how to advance the slides. All right, they're gonna figure out how to advance the slides. Maybe Nathan can help us. <laughs> um, so, our mission at the Minnesota Department of Revenue is working together to fund Minnesota's future. Thank you. Uh, we view together as the most important part of that word. And when we think of together, we think not only of the 1,400 uh, ex excellent uh, staff members at the Department of Revenue, but also all of the other important uh, players in the tax ecosystem. So tax preparers, tax professionals, whether they be lawyers or CPAs, volunteer tax preparers, and also uh, the local county assessors, which are a key part of our ta property tax system. Uh, our vision is that everyone reports, pays, and receives the right amount, no more, no less. And that's a very precise vision that we have. And we want to make sure that everyone in Minnesota who is entitled to some of the benefits under our tax code that have been put in place by the legislature and those policy choices has ability to receive those. And we do all of this work with guided by our four values of integrity, respect, excellence and accountability. We really do focus our work on our customers. So each year the department uh, focuses on the de customers, 2.9 million individual income tax filers. Over the next few months we'll be filing individual income tax returns with us. Over 800,000 Minnesotans file property tax refunds with us. Uh, they receive those refunds in August, September and October each year. Uh, 1.5 Seven of those 2.9 million receive a refund, an individual income tax refund. Uh, we work with uh, VITA sites to make sure that uh, volunteers who are certified by the IRS can help Minnesotans file their, pro their income tax and property tax refunds. We also, through our website, provide free access to software. We're going to tell you a little bit more about these opportunities as we head into filing season. We serve all types of businesses, from Fortune 100 companies to startups and garages. We have over 160,000 Minnesota businesses who are registered to collect and remit sales tax to the department on behalf of their customers. And we have over 400,000 businesses who are registered in our e-services portal, which is how those businesses uh, file and pay. Okay. 
One of the things we focus on, uh, as I will echo what Mr. Haveman spoke about this morning, one of the objectives of the department is to make sure that our customers have an easy uh, ability to file and pay their taxes. And we do that with uh, quality customer service at the front end, making sure that they have access to the information they need about what their tax obligations are. So we have a phone line that's available. People can email us. They can stop in at, uh, in, at our St. Paul office. We serve those customers uh, both elect in both virtually and in person. We have uh, subscription email services, and if you're not subscribed to them, I would, I would uh, strongly suggest you go to our website, click on the red envelope, and you can subscribe to over 178 different subscription services, different tax topics, topics including uh, updates to law changes uh, that we send out to uh, individuals across the state of Minnesota. We have over 400,000 individuals subscribed to those information systems right now. We serve people through social media. Um, not everyone uh, likes us on Facebook yet, so I would encourage you to go to our Facebook page and like the department. It is a good place to gather information about what is happening at the department. It's often where we show some of the videos that we create to give taxpayers uh, some training about how to access systems at the, web, at the department. Um, we work to make sure that uh, customers have what they need. And last year, we helped over 1.1 million customers in person, over the phone, and through email questions. So we want to make sure we're getting them that information on the front end. Um, we also work closely with individual groups. So whether it's a veterans group or a Rotary Club, we are available to present information on taxes and make sure that they have uh, the information that they need. We also work, too, with outreach for businesses. Uh, so we have classes that we deliver across the state and online. Over 100 classes were delivered across the state last year. So not just here in St. Paul, but across greater Minnesota to make sure that businesses have the information they need so they can file and pay their taxes uh, online. Um, Assistant Commissioner Starr is going to go into a little bit more detail, but we are constantly looking to improve the te technology and the tools that we have for our customers. So we have a sales tax calculator, and we've just recently rolled out a sales tax map so that retailers can easily find the sales tax rate that is applicable to the, per the sales that they are making. Um, as you are all aware, there are more and more local option sales taxes across the state of Minnesota, and so we want to make sure retailers have access to that information. I'm now going to turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Rowley to uh, start us off on our filing season update. Thank you. Commissioner Rowley, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. For the record, my name is Cynthia Rowley, Assistant Commissioner with the Department of Revenue. Thank you for having me here today. Um, since the end of the 2018 legislative session in May, we've been updating our tax filing systems to accommodate the differences between federal and Minnesota tax laws. There were significant revisions to the federal tax laws, mm. but Minnesota law did not significantly change. Um, again, one of the, another one of the handouts that you have is represented on the screen. And there's two sides to this. We'll start with the front side. Um, this handout kind of depicts the process that we go through every year to prepare for tax filing season. So, so far, the, uh, the, since the end of last session, we've gathered frequently asked questions and provided answers on a FAQ page on our website. We've hosted webinars, listening sessions, and participated in conferences and other outreach events over the summer um, to engage a community in our filing system development work and to go through some of our 2018 filing system changes. Um, so far, we've engaged about 2,000 people in that, that outreach work. Um, we've also published final forms and instructions in early October so that our software developers, um, folks like Intuit, um, TurboTax, uh, can work on their certification and testing of software preparation. Inside the department, we've also worked to develop and test our own tax processing systems. And we've continued to work with software providers to certify and test their systems. And we continue to gauge, engage our customers, including tax professionals. The other side of the sheet, so this side, um, just highlights and provides more detail to what it takes to develop um, the tax processing system, test it, 
and make it ready for uh, use each year. So as soon as our near final forms were published in August, the department started to identify the system requirements necessary to begin development. This is how we make the tax forms and software products talk to our tax processing system. We gathered uh, the work to gather system requirements includes things like gathering information from over 20 different software providers regarding over 50 software products. We mapped how the tax returns would feed into the department's tax systems. We created paths between a tax return and a taxpayer record to make sure that they connect. Information goes to the right individual. And we set parameters for fraud detection, an important effort in these times. We've also created ways to identify errors before refunds are issued so that taxpayers get the right amount. Developers and programmers at the department and at software provider companies began building the systems based on these requirements. They test and they retest um, the systems internally to ensure everything works before moving on to the next phase. Then we move on to internal tests and software provider tests. So both the department and software providers test, adjust, and retest until all the software products work with the department's system. During this stage, we are not only testing that the electronic filing systems work, but also that the paper filing <clears throat> systems work. We test our data capture software and make sure that if someone is filing on paper, we're capturing the information accurately and correctly and that our systems know how to read the lines on the form. Finally, as we get close to the filing season open, the department starts to accept small test batches of returns to production tests. And this is the phase we're in right now. Um, these tests ensure that Minnesota's system and the software providers' products are compatible with the IRS system. And all this work is vital to ensure that Minnesotans can file and pay and receive their refunds in a timely manner. This work leads up to full implementation uh, when the tax filing system is officially opening. Um, and as Commissioner Bowerly mentioned, this year we'll open with the IRS on January 28th. As we continue to do our work uh, with software providers, we are really guided by a number of priorities um, around serving taxpayers and identifying solutions that support our taxpayers as much as possible. We work to minimize the impact on the administrative impact on all of our customers, including taxpayers, tax professionals, and software providers. We're supporting voluntary compliance through forms and instructions that illustrate the changes required to calculate 2018 Minnesota taxable income as clearly and transparently as possible. And we're focused on protecting the integrity of the tax system and administering it in accordance with the laws currently in place. <clears throat> I wanted to highlight a few of the key changes uh, for this upcoming tax year. Um, so first of all, line one of the form M1, the individual income tax form, now starts with federal adjusted gross income, or FAGI, instead of federal taxable income, or FTI. Um, many of the federal tax changes contained within the federal tax law um, impact deductions taxpayers uh, make before calculating federal taxable income and after calculating federal adjusted gross income. We changed the starting point of the form uh, to calculate the correct Minnesota taxable income as simply and as accurately as possible. For tax year 2018, taxpayers uh, may claim either the standard deduction or elect to itemize deductions on their 2018 Minnesota income tax return. And this is true regardless of the election they made on their 2018 <coughs> federal return. Um, clients whose filing status is married filing separate uh, must itemize uh, their deductions on their Minnesota return if their spouse itemized their deductions. Um, this information was published in Revenue Notice 18-01 on September 4th of 2018, and that Revenue Notice does provide more information. Um, personal exemptions are still used when filing Minnesota individual income tax returns, even though they have disappeared from the federal return. Um, 
The exemption is $4,150 as established in the IRS revenue procedure 2017-58. And this exemption amount does phase out for individuals whose incomes exceed a certain threshold. Here's some information about those standard deductions. Um, as you can see, uh, these are the amounts for 2018. Of course, additional amounts apply for taxpayers that are blind for 65 years of age or older. And dependents who can be claimed on another return have their standard deduction limited to the larger of $1,050 or earned income plus $350 up to the standard deduction for their filing status, age, and vision. And again, these amounts are based, based on IRS Revenue Procedure 2017-58. We have five new schedules this year to accommodate federal changes because Minnesota law has not changed. So the forms you, you see on this slide are forms we've added to capture things that still exist for Minnesota tax filing purposes. And it allows our taxpayers to um, take deductions um, for the additional itemized deductions, casualty and theft loss, moving expenses, et cetera. In addition to these new schedules, there's a, a schedule, the Schedule M1NC, which is federal adjustments, has changed from last year to account for the differences between federal and state law. Uh, this schedule is now two columns. There's an addition column and a subtractions <coughs> column. And some of the federal changes to income can only result in additional income for Minnesota purposes. So for these provisions, we've grayed out the subtraction column, like on line three in this example, or in this, this slide. Some of the federal changes can only result in less income for Minnesota purposes. And so we've grayed out the additions column, like on line one. Some of the federal provisions can uh, result in either additional or less Minnesota income, depending on the taxpayer's situation. So. Um, we've not grayed out either column for these provisions like you see on line 10. Taxpayers enter their adjustments as a positive amount in the appropriate column and um, report those differences. So we'll, we'll look now at um, how the new schedules flow into the M1 or the individual income tax return. And this you also have as a handout. This, one. this is a full picture. <coughs> So this visual is about uh, individual income tax forms and schedules, and uh, the visual is published on our website, and so are the forms and schedules. Um, this visual uh, illustrates how the individual income tax forms interact to complete returns for this filing season. So that on this uh, handout, that the middle column represents key lines on the M1, or the individual income tax return. Um, and the left and right hand columns represent forms and schedules um, that feed into each of those lines on the M1. We encourage you to sign up for our email lists. Um, you can do that by going to our website, selecting the red envelope um, in the lower right hand corner and choosing individual income tax updates for tax professionals, among other lists, to stay up to date. Uh, you can also stay up to date on the most recent tax law information by selecting the orange uh, tax law change button, as you see here. Uh, that's where we'll post updates and information as it becomes available. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jenny Starr. Commissioner Rowley, thank you so much. Commissioner Starr. Mr. Welcome. Chair, members of the committee, Jenny Starr, um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm just going to give a few additional updates on the business income tax side um, for this upcoming filing season. Um, as my colleague explained, we've really focused this year um, on listening to our customers and in particular our tax professional and tax preparer um, customers who um, have been letting us know what the most frequently asked questions are. Um, as they've been preparing for this filing season. Um, we answered over 50 frequently asked questions on our website and posted those answers um, as quickly as we could um, before filing season. Here on the slide is an example of one of the first questions regarding 
um, businesses that we received. Um, the question is, will Minnesota allow my, my business to use the same small business method of accounting for Minnesota that is now required under the TCJA um, for my business federally? Um, and one thing we learned um, is that in reviewing Minnesota statutes, particularly 29007 subdivision two, we identified that Minnesota current law without the need of a federal update in this particular area permits the use of the accounting method that is regularly used by the taxpayer as long as that method clearly and fairly reflects the taxpayer's income. When we used our website and our outreach programs to try and get this kind of information um, to our tax uh, prepared tax professional customers as quickly as possible. Um, if you go to our website, you'll find um, the rest of the frequently asked questions, many of those um, with regard to businesses in particular. We also, um, like our um, colleagues in the individual income tax side of filing season, um, needed to prepare this year a number of nonconformity schedules um, to help taxpayers identify um, the differences between current federal law and current Minnesota law um, to allow them to prepare their Minnesota returns accurately. So as you'll see on the screen, we have seven new nonconformity schedules um, for each of the business income tax returns um, to report those nonconformity adjustments. Each of these seven new nonconformity schedules have a very similar look and feel. Um, these forms were modeled after the nonconformity schedule that has existed for a number of years on the individual income tax return. Um, in addition to these um, additional nonconformity schedules, there are four new worksheets included in our instructions um, to assist in calculating, again, those nonconformity adjustments. We've been very focused on providing as many tools as possible um, for our customers um, to help folks through this filing season. Um, that includes the creation of those new forms, those schedules, and those worksheets. And then also handouts like this one um, you'll find in your packet um, where we have uh, tried to identify um, which nonconformity items um, can be found on which schedules and worksheets um, so that tax preparers uh, can find a place where they can easily digest um, if these particular items um, are in play with your particular business activity, um, here's a helpful way to understand uh, where those adjustments are going to appear on the return. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the filing season. I thought we'd also share a little bit um, about what's going on in sales tax. And I know we've all heard a lot about Wayfair, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but we've, before we go there, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in our sales and criminal investigations division at Revenue. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the term Zapper, or sales suppression device or software. Um, this is software that allows a business to delete part of its cash transactions after the fact, um, creating a second set of books in their point of sale system allowing businesses to report smaller sales and to illegally keep some of the sales tax um, that their customers paid in trust to them to be remitted to the state. Um, the use of Zappers violates trust between uh, customers and a business. It deprives the state, local governments, um, and the public of tax revenue, <coughs> and it creates an unfair advantage um, over businesses that are accurately collecting and remitting all of the sales tax um, to the government. Early in May, we, along with the St. Louis County Attorney's Office, announced the first convictions, criminal convictions, of two individuals in a related business for tax crimes connected with the use of sales suppression software. During the plea hearing, uh, the defendants um, admitted to intentionally using the Zapper software which they referred to as Happy World. Um, the department was, um, that software was contained in a thumb drive, which I hope you can see on the screen here, which the department's criminal investigators discovered during a search warrant of the restaurant in question. Uh, working with computer forensic specialists, the department was able to open this Happy World software and learn more about how it can be used so you'll see on half of the slide here, a screen image of what that program looks like. 
And I know um, the writing is very small. Um, in the picture, you'll see a number of buttons at the bottom of the computer screen. They're named things like remove selected orders, rearrange order numbers, change by percentage, um, double click to change the order. And what we learned working with our computer forensic specialists is that um, this relatively simple computer program can make some really sophisticated changes to a business's point of sale system. So one simple example is it can, you can select cash transactions over a specific period of time and delete those transactions altogether and then reorder the order numbers to make it look like nothing is missing. Or you can go in and select transactions with a particular kind of purchase. Um, so maybe everyone who ordered a double cheeseburger over a particular point of time and the system can erase the double cheeseburger and replace it with a side order of fries. Um, so in this way, the sales receipt still exists in the point of sale system and may not look um, at first glance as a receipt that has been zapped in some way. We are continuing to identify this kind of sales suppression either through devices or software um, like the one I've described here or through uh, direct gross under reporting simply making manual changes to a business's books and records. You can expect to see more cases and more headlines like this one um, from our work at Revenue. And we want to thank the legislature um, in particular for the laws you passed in 2017 establishing a fem felony criminal penalty for this kind of use of sales suppression devices. Um, that 2017 law change will continue to support the department um, and our law enforcement partners as we continue to do this work. I've given that presentation before and it's a little more lighthearted in this room it felt a little <laughs> sad. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the impacts of Wayfair. As you know, on June 21st, the United States Supreme Court ruled in South Dakota versus Wayfair um, that physical presence is not required for sellers to create substantial nexus and be responsible um, for sales tax collection for the state of Minnesota and, and other states. Um, this decision by the Supreme Court caused two existing laws in Minnesota to go into effect. The first was originally enacted in 1989 and it's Minnesota's economic nexus law. Um, this is what requires remote sellers that exceed our small seller threshold and sell goods or services into the state of Minnesota from another state um, to register and collect uh, Minnesota sales tax. The second existing Minnesota law is our marketplace law, which was originally enacted in 2017. Um, and Wafer also caused this law to go into effect. Uh, we won't go into the details um, now. Commissioner uh, Starr, if you just hold up a second. Yeah. So I know who the chair of the tax committee was in 2017, Chair Davids, but Representative Carlson in 1989, <laughs> do you remember who would have been the chair of the tax committee that year? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just wondering who had the forethought to think about that because it took, you know, what, almost 30 years later for that to take place. And I know we talked about this last year in tax, last couple of years in tax committee with the marketplace and so forth. But 19 years ago, Mr. Chairman, yeah, oh, I've got a good memory. But yeah, OK, I was just I, I thought. Again, without I, I thought you were the only one I could really ask uh, to, to have that information, Representative Carlson. So we'll have that is the quiz for the day, oh, and, and maybe oh. Representative oh. Lauren Solberg, could sure. you go ahead and holler that out if you? Well, I think it was Tomlinson. I don't, <coughs> Representative Chairman, Tomlinson. I think you would have been back in the '70s. I, I don't think well, you would have been. I was going to call her dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could have Miss Michael call her dad. He, he, he would know, I'm sure. So, well, all right. Well, we'll maybe if someone gets that information, bring it to the front desk here, and uh, we'll report that. Um, was Representative Sable ever the tax chair, Representative Carlson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, no. But uh, when he was speaker, he would always be on the tax uh, conference committee. He had a high 
interest in taxes. And I know there was a representative, Kelly. Kelly was, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the chair of taxes, I think my second or third term. Back in the next and so that, all right. There was a uh, tax uh, chairman when I was first elected, and I was on the tax committee in 73 when I was first elected. <laughs> and he was appointed, I think, at midterm to uh, a judgeship. And um, at any rate, uh, I think we can, okay. I got my iPad open. I can begin yeah, to and well, and I think Representative Fabian is, looked like he had some information possibly. Maybe he's ahead of us on the research. Yeah. <laughs> Representative uh, Fabian. Um, Mr. Chair, I just looked up online here. It's amazing what uh, Google knows <clears throat> that I don't know. It looks like maybe it was D. Long. That's what I see. Ooh, Representative Long? Yeah. Could have been. She was chair. Yeah. Very, very good. Who was in the Senate? Was it Dougie Johnson? <coughs> Representative Ogren after Representative. So, all right. I think it probably was Representative D. Long. So, very good. So, <laughs> she was. She we figured that out. This tax committee can do anything. <laughs> figure that. All right. So thank you, members, for weighing in on that. So um, are we back to? Uh, okay, Commissioner Starr. Sorry for the <laughs> interruption. Mr. Chair, members, um, I would just note that while Wayfair impacted remote sellers and marketplace providers, it of course also um, impacts uh, sellers here in the state of Minnesota. Um, sellers here in the state who are selling through a marketplace um, would be impacted by this law change. Of course, our sellers here in Minnesota who are selling into other states, and then um, sellers who now need to also make sure that they're uh, collecting the right amount of local tax um, to their sales and destinations across the state of Minnesota. Um, like our work in the income tax filing season, um, since the Supreme Court decision was announced in June, um, we've been working really hard to provide education, guidance, and resources um, to remote sellers, marketplace providers, and Minnesota sellers, um, hoping to provide the necessary information and tools that people need to comply with our sales tax laws. We started communicating um, with taxpayers um, the day the decision was announced. We hosted an emergency meeting of the Streamlined Sales Tax Governing Board at our offices in St. Paul. Within weeks of the decision, that meeting gave us an opportunity to hear from affected businesses um, from across the country and to do that work of gathering people's most frequently asked questions, uh, which we dedicated our resources to getting answered um, on our website as quickly as possible. Um, we've posted uh, more than 30 answers to frequently asked questions for this community of our customers um, since the decision was announced. Um, and then we've been working on tools. So many of you might be familiar with our sales tax rate calculator. It's been available on our website for a number of years. I think it's the third most popular um, hit on our website. Uh, folks <coughs> use this. They enter in an address um, and an amount of the sale, and it will calculate the correct amount of sales tax uh, for the source or location of that sale. Um, but we've been working to improve this resource we, because we know it's so heavily utilized by people. Um, over the last couple of legislative sessions, um, I've worked with uh, members of the legislature and some of your constituents who have very much wanted us to create a downloadable Excel spreadsheet um, that would do the same thing that the calculator does um, but would do it on um, people's desktop computers without the need to go out to our website. Um, this was actually a hard, a hard tool to create, um, but I want you to know that we finally got there. Um, there is now a downloadable Excel spreadsheet. Uh, folks who rely on this need to remember to download it every quarter because uh, local rates can be updated on a quarterly basis. But once you've downloaded it, uh, you can enter in a nine-digit zip code um, and it will produce the local uh, and state rates for that location uh, for you. And then we figured out how to do this. <laughs> so this is our new sales tax rate map. And we are really excited about it. <laughs> uh, this works like, a, like other maps that you would find online. You can click and drag and zoom. Um, you can enter in a an address. 
If you start to enter an address, it will help you auto populate uh, the potential addresses in Minnesota. So I can enter my home address. It will auto populate that for me. I can choose from a list of potential addresses that are the one I'm looking for. Um, and it will show you visually the address you've looked up and show you the rate that applies. If you put in a sales transaction amount, it'll calculate the tax for you. And then you can hit a button that will download that information and you can print it for your records if um, for whatever reason um, you need to keep that information going forward. Um, we've heard really uh, good things about this. Um, and again, this is a space of thanks um, to legislators and legislative staff. Uh, we put this map out last legislative session for beta testing. Uh, we gathered a lot of feedback through surveys on how people wanted to use it and what made it uh, work best for people. Um, and we were able to incorporate a lot of that feedback into the final product. The last tool that I would note for you um, is what we call certified service providers. So through our partnership with Streamline Sales Tax, Minnesota being a full member of Streamline Sales Tax, uh, we also work with certified service providers or CSPs. Now these are companies that have been certified by Streamline Sales Tax to perform all of a seller's sales and use tax functions. Uh, the CSP software works with a seller's accounting system to identify which products and services that they're selling are taxable. It applies the appropriate uh, tax rate and records uh, the transaction. The CSP software also prepares and files returns and remits tax to each Streamline member state. Um, and what's more, Streamline member states, including Minnesota, certify the accuracy of CSP software and we provide liability relief for incorrect tax calculation based on that certification. CSPs also resolve any notices or audits by member states. Um, so in addition to that Minnesota calculator, the downloadable spreadsheet, um, and the map, CSPs are also a great tool um, for businesses who are collecting Minnesota's state and local sales taxes. I, we often get asked, what are we hearing um, about Minnesota's existing laws, the law from 89 and the law from 2017, um, and the implementation of uh, that as a result of Wayfair. Um, one thing that we heard um, is that Minnesota was one of 11 states after the Wayfair decision um, that was identified as green to go by the Tax Foundation for implementation of Wayfair. Um, and that's because our laws already provided since 1989 that safe harbor by excluding small remote sellers um, from, Minis from the obligation to collect and remit. Uh, we were green to go also because um, we announced as early as July 25th that remote sellers and marketplace providers would need to begin complying with our laws no later than October 1st. This met the expectation by the Supreme Court that states not engage in retroactive collection. And then as a full member of Streamline, our laws already provide a number of the simplification items that the US Supreme Court was looking for, including things like a single level of administration of both state and local taxes, as well as access to that software through certified service providers. Um, so what we know since October 1st is that our customers are using our website they're also uh, making use of a number of webinars that we've been providing for remote sellers, Minnesota sellers, um, and marketplaces. And we know this. We know that, you know, recently I went out and bought a really big TV and a sound bar and a subwoofer. It was great fun. <laughs> and, you know, I paid the same amount of tax in my local retailer that I would have paid um, online if I had chosen to purchase it there. And that's a good thing for fairness in our system. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Bowerly uh, for some additional department updates. Commissioner Starr, before you go on, I have one comment and one question. And the comment is Representative Petersburg showed uh, some information that Representative Paul Ogren took over as tax chair November 1st of 1989. So if there was a special session that year, Representative Carlson, do you remember there's a special session that year? 
<laughs> that maybe we cannot give Representative Long all the credit if, in fact, there was a special session after November 1st that they would have passed that law. So we need further research. We haven't quite got to the bottom of this. The one question I have, um, Mr. Starr, is the small seller threshold. I know the South Dakota state had a certain amount of uh, value in the sales, which is different than Minnesota, which is something that we might uh, certainly have to address. So can you, could you elaborate on that a little bit, on what the differences are between what was in the Supreme Court case of South Dakota versus what Minnesota's law is? And if, if not, we can get that. Mr. Chair, uh, members. And House Research may know that. Right, so I wor sometimes I worry that I'm going to forget and get this wrong. Minnesota has two tiers of a threshold. Um, so it's either over 100 sales and 100,000 dollars. No, over. No, I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we does, can how, try. does House Research know? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I answer this question a lot. <laughs> It's Mr. Clayman? Commissioner Bowerly knows. Oh, or, We're going to know. We're going to defer yeah, we'll, Mr. Clayman. All right. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Clayman. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I actually, uh, Assistant Commissioner Starr, I believe, um, was on the right track. I believe it is 100 sales or, uh, or uh, it was $100,000 is, is the, the threshold under our small seller exception. Then there's another the minimum exception for marketplace providers, which is, I believe, ten thousand dollars, and okay, a certain Ms. number of sales. Mr. Chair, I ha I've looked it up on our frequently asked questions. Very good, Commissioner okay. Starr. <laughs> so, it's a hundred or more retail sales shipped to Minnesota, or ten or more retail sales shipped to Minnesota that total more than a hundred thousand dollars. And South Dakota's um, law does not has a simpler approach to that threshold. And so I think you're correct. There will be conversation um, around Minnesota's 1989 visionary law <laughs> and what it should be today. Very good. So uh, committee members, so this is something we may have to look to adjust to make sure we're kind of in line with what the Supreme Court case said, just to be certain on that. So uh, Representative O'Neill. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question about uh, the new governor and his policies moving forward. Different governors have had different sort of uh, stands on uh, what triggers an audit, whether it be income tax audit or more um, commonly done, the sales tax audit. And uh, some commissioners have created a system of just red flagging something that looks out of step. Some have said, we're going to just audit every single small business uh, every three years. So, you know, you have a three and a half year look back that you can collect sales tax for. So that was basically every single small business would be captured in that. So what is Governor Walz's stand on sales tax audits in particular? Because I know probably every single member has constituents that have complained to them of these sales tax audits that have come in and taken a lot of their time and a lot of their money. Uh, it takes accounting uh, work and lawyer work. And uh, their their initial bill, I, anecdotally, I'm always hearing is... Um, Thirty to 40000 in sales tax and fines and fees, and then it usually gets whittled down to about three to 5000 to which the accountants say, just pay it because you're going to pay us more to whittle it down anymore. Uh, so just curious what uh, the governor has on his docket now for how he will be treating small businesses with it. Is, will it be more of a red flag sort of system uh, looking for um, you know, things that look out of place, or are we just going to audit every single small business again every three years? Um, Mr. Chairman and Representative, um, first, I think I would, um, I can't speak for governors uh, prior to Governor Dayton, but it has, in my experience with the department, is department policies around auditing, often directed by uh, necessity or uh, choices that the legislature makes. So I don't anticipate that Governor Walls will have a particular stance on auditing, and like I said, Governor Dayton did. I don't, can't speak for uh, the department under Governor Pawlenty. Uh, what I will tell you is that uh, the audit system that we use now is focused on education first and uh, working with those furthest com from compliance. 
One of the things that the department knows is that in the 2000s era, uh, we operated under compliance initiatives. The legislature would ask the department to hire a certain number of auditors and collectors and really focus the work on those two activities and in order to raise revenue for the state budget. And so the department would be given a certain dollar amount and needed to hire uh, auditors and collectors only. And so we were in businesses every three years because that's what we were being asked to do on behalf of the state budget. And I will tell you that since those compliance uh, initiative years ended, the department has really focused on holistically serving our customers. So again, starting with that education and outreach. So after, when we ended those compliance years, we were doing, I think, you know, a handful, maybe two dozen classes for sales tax across the state of Minnesota so that businesses could learn what their obligations were. Now we do over 100. We think it's really important to help businesses get it right. We know most Minnesotans want to pay their taxes and file their taxes in the right way. And what we do now, and I'll, I'll maybe ask Assistant Commissioner Starr to talk a little bit more about the high-level aspects of how we approach auditing at the department. Commissioner Starr. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, what I would add um, to Commissioner Bowerly is the other thing that um, has changed at the department over the past few years um, is that we've worked really hard um, to make sure that we're surveying our audit customers at the end of um, audits uh, to identify ways in which um, our audit programs went, worked well and ways in which our audit programs um, did not uh, hit the mark and where we could improve. Um, one thing that we've learned in particular from our sales and use tax customers um, is well over 90%, I think uh, sometimes 95 to even 97% um, in some quarters uh, report in those surveys that they feel that they were treated fairly um, during the audit process. Um, and those, those kinds of survey responses help us know uh, that our um, programs have changed over time um, and are uh, treating our customers in a fair, respectful uh, manner during the course of an audit. Um, other ways in which we've worked to improve on the corporate franchise tax side um, is we've heard from our customers um, that our audits take too long. Um, some of you may have uh, remember uh, that from um, the research and development uh, work or uh, report that came out a session ago. Um, we're happy to report that well over 80%, almost 90% of corporate audits today are completed within a year's time, which is actually a, a really good time frame um, for the complexity of a corporate franchise tax return. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think we're gonna hold up on questions right now because I'd like Commissioner Bowerly to, to finish up. Uh, this is an important topic, but I, I just want uh, to finish up and make sure we have time and then any and all questions when we're done. So Commissioner Bowerly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. We just have a few more uh, pieces of information we'd like to share with you and then we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, so first I wanna share with you that we, uh, based on our customer feedback, uh, we, are redesign we are looking to redesign our website. Uh, we are rolling out a beta version of a new website. Uh, it is available right now, so I do hope that you will take a chance to go to our website and take a look at this beta. Um, this is your opportunity to tell us if it takes too many clicks to get to the precise information that you are looking for. Uh, so this is your opportunity. And then we will take all of that feedback that we learn and push it into uh, the new website that we'll be rolling out this summer. Um, so for this beta period, our uh, current website is what people will use to file and pay their taxes and get the information that they need. But this new version is available for testing and for you to take a look at. So we will be looking for your help once again uh, in this beta to make sure that we are serving you as our key customers and all of our customers uh, as we roll this new uh, product out. Um, one of the other uh, things you'll be hearing more from us in the near future, but wanted to hit on today, you, in your packets you have uh, some information about free income tax filing. Um, so this is uh, provided by uh, all of the software vendors who are providing tax uh, software in Minnesota. Those who are part of what's called the Free File Alliance, which is a national organization of software vendors who provide free access to, uh, to taxpayers. So last year, nearly 90% of Minnesotans used electronic software to file their taxes. And many more are eligible to electronically file their state and federal taxes for free 
uh, using the software. More than 800,000 Minnesotans were eligible for free filing but did not take advantage of it. So we're looking for your help to make sure that people know about this opportunity. <laughs> Uh, we also want to make sure people know about VITA sites, which are uh, where certified uh, volunteers prepare taxes for uh, individuals across the state of Minnesota. Um, we have uh, options. These are available, like I said, on our website. So if you access the software through our website and you meet the eligibility criteria, which are laid out there, uh, you can access that free software. And on our website as well are the locations of the VITA sites and AARP sites, which provide that free tax preparation for individuals across Minnesota. Um, if you go to our website and put free file into the search box, you will see both of those opportunities. And we really encourage, again, free file or electronic filing really is the <coughs> best way to file your taxes that walk <coughs> through step by step the information that you will need to complete both your federal and your state taxes. And of course, we always encourage direct deposit because it is the most, uh, it is the quickest and most effective way to get your refund. Um, as we uh, mentioned at the beginning, 2.9 million Minnesotans are about to file their uh, tax returns and 1.7 will be uh, looking for, 1.7 million approximately, there's obviously some, uh, it's not a big round number, but we'll be receiving income tax refunds. And we know that is an important uh, question. People want to say, I always ask, what it, how long will it take to get my refund? And the answer to that question is, of course, it depends. Uh, every return is different and every tax year is different. Uh, and we want, so we want to just give you a little bit of information. We know your constituents often ask you that question about where their tax refund is. And we want to make sure you have uh, some background information and then some resources for them. So there are two ways to file a tax return, of course, electronically on paper. If it comes in electronically, that return is sent directly into our tax system. If it's filed on paper, we have to open it and we scan it, and then it's transmitted into our electronic filing system. Um, it also has to get that data that uh, has to be translated from uh, people's handwriting into the tax system. So there's a data capture process where we might have to spot check that and make sure that the information is correct. So um, I'm sure that everyone thinks they have excellent handwriting. I have seen some of these tax returns. I will tell you electronic filing is actually a much better process for everyone. And if you need a paper form, we will still continue to provide that. Um, every return is different and we review every return either electronically or with trained staff to make sure that the right refund goes to the right person. Um, if we have questions or is there something that's missing from a return, we will send a letter to a taxpayer and ask them to give us a call or send that information back in so that we can make sure that the right amount really is uh, getting to that person. And then once approved, individuals either receive their refund uh, by mail or directly into their bank account. And it's a similar process for uh, property tax refunds that are uh, sent out in later in the summer and those 800,000 returns go through the same process, whether electronically or on paper. Um, one of the things that we have been talking with this committee about is the increased uh, incidence of identity theft. Uh, many of us uh, either have been or know someone who's been a victim of identity theft. And identity thieves are no longer only using that information to open a credit card or uh, take out a line of credit, but they are filing fraudulent refund claims as well. And so over the past few years, we have been working very hard at the department to prevent this information from getting in the hands of criminals and then make sure that we're not sending state general fund dollars in the name of a Minnesota taxpayer uh, to a criminal. So we wanna make sure the right refund not only the right amount, but gets to the right person. And so that is sometimes when we have individuals in Minnesota who have, like I said, been victims of identity theft, as many of us have been, uh, we wanna make sure that we're, uh, we are uh, making sure it's the right person. And so uh, the length of time that it takes to process a refund can vary from year to year. And as I mentioned earlier, we need, because of this increase in identity theft, we wanna make sure that we're not sending general fund dollars to criminals. Uh, we will always make sure that the individual Minnesotan gets their refund, um, but it can, again, we wanna make sure we're preventing uh, any of those uh, uh, refunds from going uh, to the wrong people. So I want to also note for you in your uh, packets, there is a sort of what we consider a little poster about, it's called Stop, Connect, Confirm. <coughs> Tax scams are unfortunately also uh, very prevalent. Uh, we are, you see on the news uh, reports that there are people calling up people asking for particular information. 
One of the scams that we have been seeing over the past two years is uh, asking people for W-2 files. Uh, so uh, this actually has happened to a number of businesses in Minnesota. Um, it's where the, someone gets an email. It looks like it's from uh, somebody who should be asking for this file. Somebody goes, goes to somebody in human resources or goes to somebody in payroll and asks for the W-2 file. Um, and unfortunately, they have handed those over. And those are spoofing emails, and they are now handed over a W-2 file for all of their employees to a criminal. And so we have been working hard with uh, HR departments, with financial services organizations, and with CPAs, because of course CPAs and tax professionals have valuable information in their systems to really make sure that if you get, an, get a request for this kind of information, that you check in with that person directly uh, in person or by phone and make sure that that is a valid request. Uh, because once that uh, information has gone out, a W-2 file, of course, is a very good set of information from which to file a fraudulent tax refund claim. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're also helping prevent that. Um, and finally, I want to take a moment, um, Mr. Chair and members, to talk about uh, the department's efforts to see or secure taxpayer data. We take very seriously the responsibility that we have when we gather people's tax information, obviously has very sensitive information in it. And we use technology uh, that is, uh, helps us protect that, of course. Uh, technology also helps us make sure things are convenient for our customers. Um, we use security pro protocols for our e-services business accounts, much like you would find when you were to log into your bank account. So there's, uh, there's two-factor authentication, just like you would if you were trying to log in and make a transaction uh, with your bank. Uh, the department also, uh, as a part of our processes, also receives from the IRS federal taxpayer information. FTI is classified uh, through a federal uh, regulation, and so we have a, we have some security processes in place also that are required by the federal government <clears throat> through uh, publication 1075, which is a regulation that governs how we manage that information electronically and in hard copy. Um, we follow NIST standards, the Center for Internet Security standards, um, and we make sure that our technology systems are constantly updated to protect against any uh, potential threat. Um, we also make sure that everyone at the, who works at the Department of Revenue understands that protecting taxpayer information is everyone's job. Obviously, our technology is very important, uh, but as we've just discussed, an individual opening an email can also put at risk an entire system, an entire email system. And so we train our staff annually and regularly uh, uh, through ongoing campaigns to make sure that people know about our technology and that they are taking uh, steps to make sure that they're not, uh, that they are preventing any uh, suspicious activity, reporting any suspicious emails that we get. Um, and we also, of course, maintain inventories of our physical devices and systems. And then we also work very hard on web filtering, our antivirus and anti-malware protection, and making sure that layer of protection is always there. So that is, those are some of the things that we do to help make sure we're protecting the taxpayer data. We take that responsibility very seriously. So on behalf of uh, my colleagues, Assistant Commissioners Starr and Rowley, we want to thank you for this time and the opportunity to share with you some of what's going on at the department. We look forward to working with this committee throughout session to answer any questions that you have about the tax administration that we uh, engage in at the Department of Revenue. If you have constituents who have questions or concerns, we encourage you to uh, pass those along to us, and we are happy to discuss any particular issues with you. We also know that one of our, uh, some of our work this session will be considering whether and how to conform to the federal law changes as we move forward in session, uh, and so we look forward to working with you on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Commissioner Bowerly, thank you for that very good and interesting information. Thank you so much. We do have member questions. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so kind of back to the, the audit discussion, um, I just appreciate that, you know, we're trying to make the website easier. We're trying to make it easier for people to get the information because I think, you know, if there are errors in your reporting, I don't think that a lot of folks necessarily are, you know, out to do bad things so much as confusion about the right way to report things. So I just want to make the connection between the ease of accessing the information and hopefully getting things correct. Because if if I'm paying what I'm supposed to be paying, it's only fair that, that businesses are paying what they're supposed to be paying as well. So just wanted to kind of make the connection between the work you're doing and make that 
the, the information easier to access. And just kind of thank you for putting the time and the effort into doing the outreach and the education because I think that's um, a really important piece of, of making sure that when folks are audited, it isn't like the boogeyman. It's um, more of assisting them in making sure they're doing things correctly. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question is for Commissioner Starr. Uh, now that I'm, I'm looking at the sales tax rate map, and thank you for providing the map. Uh, I'll look it up on your website so I can see exactly. But how do you address uh, a business that is doing business in all of these different counties that have different rates? I mean, is that, you know, what is being done to help that business? Because I have one that's being audited now based on that very issue, that there are different tax rates in surrounding counties. So how, how does the department address that? Commissioner Starr or Commissioner Bowerly? Thank you. Commissioner Bowerly, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Erickson, what, that is exactly one of the reasons that we wanted to put this uh, map out and one of the reasons we have spent a lot of time trying to help businesses understand uh, what their obligations are under Minnesota <coughs> law. Uh, as this committee well knows, those local option sales taxes get layered on top of uh, other rates, the state general rate, a perhaps, perhaps a county rate, um, a local sales, a city's rate. And so we want to make sure that customers know what those are, and this map will help them do that. And prior to this map, we did have this calculator that we mentioned, and so that was has been available for for several years. Um, it, you know, I don't, we don't obviously I don't we don't tend to talk about we won't talk about individual taxpayers, but if a taxpayer uh, if a if a retail business is making sales into uh, to another location, yes. um, then of course that is, the sales taxes due at that destin at the destination of that sale. I will tell you when I. I was in St. Cloud uh, last summer and saw, talking with some of our sales tax auditors, and they were sharing with me that they have customers that they are doing audits with, and um, the local, the layers of local taxes are very challenging yeah. for yes. our retailers. And so I think that's one of the reasons we are tr constantly looking to improve the technology and improve the ways that we can help them understand what their obligations are in this layered system of these local option sales taxes. So thank you, Representative Erickson. We, we agree it's a, it's a challenge for them, and we're doing everything we can to help them uh, with the, get the information that they need to meet those uh, obligations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. A question for uh, Ms. Barley. Commissioner, uh, welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, regarding the free income tax filing, uh, I know the state has a program that helps those who uh, qualify uh, to fill out their income tax, um, and I, the, the state, uh, I don't have the number offhand, maybe staff does, but we appropriate a, a sizable amount of money to do that, mm -hmm. to help folks to file their taxes. Is this program in tangent with that? Uh, and if so, maybe perhaps you have a, co a, a number that this cost, in addition to the other program that we offer throughout the Twin Cities and throughout the state. Commissioner Bowerly. Uh, Chair Marquardt and uh, Representative, um, we, Yes, you appropriate to the Department of Revenue about $400,000 uh, a year uh, to provide uh, grants to VITA sites across the state of Minnesota. So VITA sites are those volunteer income tax sites. Um, they could be run by a local nonprofit. It could be um, in conjunction with an AARP site. That amount of money, what we know from our uh, from those uh, grantees is it's a, it's a portion of the money that they receive to help provide those services across the state of Minnesota. And so that is that in-person help, that free tax preparation assistance. There are almost 200 sites across the state of Minnesota. The grants that the state of Minnesota <coughs> provides provides a very small portion of the funding that those sites receive. So. Um, I think as we talk through session, we will be hearing from uh, some of the, those organizations about the need for additional funding uh, for that free tax help, which goes, again, to people who might be veterans, people over a certain age, um, people who have incomes under about $55,000 uh, to get that free in-person help. The other uh, program I was talking about is electronic access to free electronic filing. That is provided through the software vendors themselves. So the software vendors who do business here in the state of Minnesota and, and also with the IRS provide access to their, their software, the same software that you would be able to uh, access if you downloaded it on their website. It, they provide free access to those individuals, and that is provided by that software vendor community. 
Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, commissioners and assistant commissioners, for being here. And I know in the past I've heard too that um, you're able, especially with the fraud issue, it's easier. Is it easier for you to um, screen for that fraud if people are filing online? Commissioner, uh, Representative and Mark Horton, Representative or Chair Mark Horton, Representative Joachim, uh, we encourage people to file electronically. It is certainly the easiest way for customers because it walks them through step by step what they need to do uh, to get to the right amount of, of tax or refund. Um, electronic filing has lots of benefits for us. It, it does allow us to. Um, our systems to operate more efficiently and through that process we can uh, use all of our tools to make sure that we are addressing the fraud. Thank you. Oh, all right, Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question about some of the conformity issues. Um, first of all, I personally think it would be helpful if we could take a look at some of the changes in conformity and what we would have to do and specifically some of those base broadeners. If we could get some kind of outline as to which of those base broadeners are one-time money, which would be ongoing money, just to kind of have a good sense of uh, you know the the amount of money that this committee has to work with as we take a look at conformity. Um, but also, I want to talk about slide number seven, uh, specifically talking about 2018 form M1, the starting point. Now here it says that it's going to be the uh, federal adjusted gross income and that is a change from what I understand from previous tax years where we've used the uh, federal taxable income. Is that something, well obviously that's something that revenue can do without direction from the legislature. Is that a rule change revenue can make? Commissioner Bauer. Chair Mark Ward and Representative Lean, um, first to your question about one-time money and ongoing money, we'd be happy to follow up with you, and I, I think um, your uh, house staff as well probably has ac ready access to that information, but we're happy to get you that information. With respect to the starting point of the form, so Minnesota law starts with, that, uh, with conformity at FTI. That has not changed. That is a change that would require an act of the legislature and an, act of, and an, and an enacted law. What we have done for the simplicity of taxpayers is to start the form at AGI because as Assistant Commissioner Rowley mentioned there are it is the simplest way for Minnesotans to be able to calculate the right amount of tax. So we are the form still gets you to exactly the right amount under Minnesota law starting with FTI where we are conformed but the form starts with a different place to make the calculations easier. So we've simply changed the starting point of the form but the law of course starts with FTI. Representative Lee. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up then, our, I don't exactly quite know how to ask this, but what I'm trying to get at is would the form then take into account the change, the, would the state form then take into account the changes on the federal form between AGI and federal taxable income? Would that be all then on the state form, some of those numbers? Commissioner Bowerly or? I'm going to. Rowley. Mr. Chair, representatives, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the, um, uh, between the MC and some of those additional schedules uh, that we talked about earlier, um, we account for all of the differences between FAGI um, and help the <coughs> get to the right amount of tax as the bottom line. Okay, thank you. So, so things like standard deductions and exemptions sure. and so on are, are good examples of that. Uh, thank you. Representative Leslegard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, congratulations on, on being appointed commissioner, Mrs. Bali. Uh, my question is, is, getting back to the sale uh, suppression of software zappers, is this a growing um, problem and a trend you see uh, moving forward? And if so, do we have the resources to be tracking um, this? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> commissioner Bowerly. Thank you, uh, Representative Marquardt and uh, Representative. Uh, so we have been, we along with, you know, other revenue agencies, other countries have uh, been seeing this uh, growing uh, trend over the last few years. Uh, we know that our colleagues in Canada have taken uh, sort of bigger steps as a, as a country and as in provinces. Um, we think that our, our new law, which makes the possession of this a felony, and then of course the tax consequences 
Um, we think that we, we probably have the right law, but I will tell you as we work through these cases, we may come back to you and tell you that we think additional law changes might be helpful in making sure we can get at all of, uh, at all of this. This is, uh, we are, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not uh, typically very Minnesotan to brag, but I think our team is, is really in the space of leading the country and doing this investigation and getting to these convictions. We appreciate so much the support of our local prosecutors who work these cases uh, with us and bring the charges. And I think that uh, what we, we used to see sort of, you know, we used to, you can imagine from movies, right? You find the second set of books under the counter. Well, now the second set of books can just be kept on your point of sale system with the help of this kind of software. And so I think that uh, it's probably a true thing that uh, criminals are very creative and people who are trying to avoid laws can be very creative and we will uh, do our very best to keep up with them. Anything you want to add? Uh, thank you. Representative Lestigard. I was just going to say thank you, and then also if you uh, the resources becomes an issue, um, I would encourage you to uh, come back and, and seek them because if this is a growing trend, that a problem is going to affect uh, all Minnesotans, that we need to address it. So thank you. Very good. See no further questions. Commissioner Bowerly and Commissioner Rowley and Commissioner Starr, thank you so much for your testimony today and information. The committee looks forward to working with you and. Appreciate all your work in the past and, and looking forward to a good session. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.